for, for, for OPQC, for OPQC, we have moved on to, to uh, from our antenatal, uh, from our ACT project into the era of progesterone. I've given 100 progesterone talks in the last little bit. Uh, Jen and I have a little more overlap, so we hope we can make that work to our advantage and, and skip over some stuff. We're going to talk uh, about statewide. I've tried to be a little more statewide and a little less intra-hospital stuff because that's really kind of what I do. There are some pluses and minuses of having statewide projects. You've heard a little bit, you know, directly and indirectly about other states. Um, Ohio, in, in Ohio, there have been a couple of things, and besides us, that have operated to our advantage. And I think we've learned some of the things that work for a, a state where you're not really in control of the system very much and you don't have a whole lot of money to, to spend on. The advantages of a state-based uh, effort are that there's some authority in saying that someone at the Department of Health is watching. Uh, there's a vital record system that's already there, the birth, the birth registry. Ohio has decided to stop calling it the birth certificate implying you have a piece of paper that says I was born. Rather, you have a register of the birth and it's a part of the health records of the state. And there's, there's release of data and there is some confidence that funding will continue. OPQC has operated on grants specific or contracts specific to a, to a project. We, are, we exist project to project. If the state or somebody else doesn't fund us, we sort of live on fumes until somebody else comes along. And the state knows that they have to do that, but we don't know where our next paycheck is coming from. And that's a problem, but that's not a problem for the birth registry. On the other hand, our bureaucratic overseers, as nice as they are individually, still have some bureaucratic rules to follow. Uh, the variability in the birth registry information has been talked about. And, and there's often a delay between collection and reporting. Let me say at this point, that reminds me to say, there are some key people in this. Ed Donovan in particular, those of you in neonatology know Ed is a neonatologist at the University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Children's. He's the one who unlocked the key to the Ohio Department of Health and Vital Statistics Division. He's the one that persuaded them that they should talk and share data and that public data could be used for good and Ed did that quite a while before he invented OPQC. He just invited me and others to come along. But it's Ed Donovan who's in Colorado. If any of you are in Colorado, do what Ed says. We always think, you know, what would Ed do now? So he's the one who <coughs> made it possible. The other uh, names are just names, but really John and John. There's John at the Ohio Department of Health, and there's John at OPQC. And if those two Johns don't come to work every day, we got nothing. They talk to each other and make things happen. The other two names are Sue, Susan and Beth, and they are the quality coordinators who travel around or talk. They, they make personal visits and phone calls. And, and that's a, a, a feature of that the state provides for us. So those kinds of key things make what we're going to talk about here uh, possible. If you look at the history of steroid assessment, I was not able to find very many studies on this. Either this paper in the Journal of Pediatrics from 2006 I thought was interesting because it was a statewide or near statewide effort in California that was driven by neonatologists. It wasn't like the, they did, they worked with the OBs. According to the article, they, they followed what was going on, they paid attention, they um, uh, increased the rate of steroid administration by paying attention and publicizing the data. But it was all a neo-driven uh, uh, activity. This is the paper uh, from Lee that Jeff Gould was a big part of, and you've heard this summarized all, already earlier today. Interestingly, on the right side of the slide down here, infants born in hospitals that had previously participated in quality improvement uh, did better than, than infants, uh, or that received steroids more often than infants born in hospitals that had not done that before. Um, the OPQC history, I'll, I gave you a little bit, and, and Jen gave you some. We can go over this pretty quickly. We started with the 20 hospitals and the 24 NEO sites, and then expanded membership to the rest of the hospitals at first, the larger level twos, and, and finally, 
really all but a couple of hospitals in Ohio, very small ones, have participated in OPQC, and now we're trying to create a, a uh, consumer base, organizational base, Ohio Hospital Association, uh, et cetera, to try to make ourselves a little broader than simply a, a data collection organization. The blue on this slide is neonatology, the red is obstetrical, and you can see the map of Ohio. There are red and blue uh, colors all over the map at pretty much every site. This is our organizational chart, and we're gonna talk about the steroid project, but you can see we talked about scheduled births before, and this project here, increasing the birth certificate accuracy so that we could spread the 39-week project to all the hospitals had a bearing on steroids and probably will have it the same thing on uh, progesterone as well. Meanwhile, our neonatal colleagues are uh, commenting, and we're commenting on each other's projects, uh, human milk, uh, a neonatal abstinence syndrome project, and we talk back and forth. Steroids is an example of a, tr a project that we did in obstetrics because our neonatal colleagues wanted us to. We thought we were doing well. It was like, yeah, we do, we're, we're good. And they were like, no, you're not. So we said, okay, let's see. We pick projects according to these guidelines, typically prematurity related with variation in practice. Uh, some sort of benchmark, there needs to be a, a guideline for us to, to go. We do not make policy, we do not create our own protocols, we are not the police. We want outcomes that are measurable and we want you to set your, um, your interpretation of those benchmarks to meet those outcomes. One of Dr. Donovan's preaches, um, uh, teachings is you need to move populations. You need to move an endpoint that matters and it ought to be something not only that you measure but something that's measured by somebody else who's not you. And if you do that, then you must have done something. And, and that's how the birth registry got involved. It wasn't so much as a check on what we collected by hand. It was more, if we can make the birth registrars, right, who are not part of OPQC at that point, if we can make them change what they write down, regardless of whether it's accurate or not, it's at least historically present. We can measure change over time. Uh, we wanted there to be always some evidence of success by somebody else, and ideally, we didn't want to really be the first spending uh, millions of dollars in Ohio on something that had never been done before. It's probably what we're doing with progesterone right now. But uh, we wanted enthusiasm by the, by the troops in the fields, and we picked the projects pretty much by, the, uh, or we exclude projects based on the level of enthusiasm. So here we're gonna talk about antenatal steroids and, and what we have done. You know, we'll see some um, overlap between what I'm gonna tell you and what Jen already showed you. One of the things she didn't show you was our pilot project. This is the basis for us in OB saying, yeah, I guess we could do this project. We haven't reported this. This is 473 births, of which there were about 10% who did not get steroids. And this is just the pie chart of why not? Why didn't they? And here's less than an hour, one hour, two hours. You can see half of the 47 women, three or four hours, five hours. So this told us where most of the problems were. And it also gave us a list of causes of why babies were not getting steroids. Uh, and and there, to some degree, that was um, a function of variation across the state. Some hospitals seem to be doing much better than others. So the combination of that pie chart plus the variation led us to go ahead. This is the same um, key driver diagram that Jen showed you, so I won't go through that much. And these are the data points that we collected. I don't believe she did show, show you all that stuff. Again, we're doing quality and we're sharing the data in a, in a de-identified data use agreement type arrangement. This is not research, some of the sites asked for IRB approval, others were happy with a business agreement uh, for limited data use. So this is the sorts of information we were able to get. The diagnoses were really pretty limited. We didn't really have anybody using dexamethasone at all. Uh, it was all betamethasone. And we tried to figure out where the, the uh, and when the various do doses were given. This is a, a similar um, format to uh, some slides you've seen before, but for us, this is uh, a timeline. This is the beginning of the project, 
and this is the, uh, the end, June of 2013. Green are, are babies who got uh, a full course, uh, blue, a partial course, red, no steroids, and these little yellow dots up here are women with PPROM between 32 and 34 weeks who are, by some people's accounting, excused from getting steroids because, quote unquote, it's not sure if it works in that population. As you can see, there aren't very many people in Ohio who believe that, but there are, must be a few. And anyway, you can see also, whoops, wrong slide, the wrong button. As you can see, this is our goal right here, and we were, as Jen showed you, we were at that goal almost from the beginning. Uh, however, the, the, a lot of the women who got a full course got a full course substantially uh, um, some time ago uh, compared to the time that they delivered. Um, the key findings are here. We, we were, in fact, giving steroids to about as many babies as we thought. We found incredibly large number and complexity of barriers to finding whether that women got steroids or not. Notably, 40% of our patients got uh, their first dose of steroids at a referring hospital. Ohio's a fairly compact state with six regional perinatal care sites. And so uh, there's a lot of the births uh, are at those care sites, about 45 or almost 50% are at the bigger hospitals, but the rest are in smaller hospitals and there's a, it's a pretty well-developed regionalized system. And so that first dose is kind of automatic. Uh, we're putting the patient in the ambulance and she's had her dose of steroids, she's got her GBS protection on board, you'll see her pretty soon. What we've learned is what you've already learned or heard about, it's hard to pick the optimal time to initiate steroids. Detection of that time is really the number one barrier. And finally, the, the uh, hand collected data is not what the uh, uh, birth registry seems to show. So we'll look at some of these things a little more uh, specifically. Steroids are given a lot of different places. Outpatient records, inpatient records, inpatient labor and delivery, yes, but inpatient on the antepartum service as well. Not very often in the emergency department. One hospital, one of our hospitals that's more into QI, stuff did PDSA cycles with their electronic medical record to try to get some sort of unanimity about who gave steroids when and where. And in order to do that, they wanted to go back to the people who entered the data and to the electronic medical record designers more than 100 times on little PDSA cycles. It was a very, very fussy. We found there were many, many names, none of which actually turned out to be ACT. Um, BMZ, ANCS, my personal favorite is roids, you know. <laughs> she got roids. Um, we learned that a lot of the neonatal charts were populated from labor and delivery records. So for those patients who got steroids on labor and delivery, they often had accurate neonatal records uh, in, in sites that didn't necessarily have a unified record. If the steroids were given antepartum or if they were given as an outpatient, um, not much. And we, we learned that if nobody uh, looks at the data, then no one really cares about the accuracy. But if you start to look at that data, uh, people care about the accuracy a lot. Here's the slide that Jen asked me if we had before. This is the sweet spot, or David Hackney's slides. Uh, David is a, uh, an MFM in Cleveland at University Hospitals. And he was um, among the drivers of this. We declared the sweet spot to be at least 48 hours before delivery and no more than two weeks before delivery, 14 days. Others might pick different, but that's what we chose. And this data is not, to my recollection, entirely up to date. I think we have a, a better later date. I couldn't find it. But we were too late in about 30%. We were way too soon in about 30%. And then we were just right. Uh, in about uh, 45 or so percent. And uh, over time, we got better. And I think the, the better slide is that the, too, the way too soon group has gone down a bit. I don't think the other two have changed very much. <coughs> but that's a big deal. That's a big issue that we've just begun to collect data on. We didn't do this on all of the births in Ohio, but we did them, and Jen showed you this a little bit. This is the same, the same list that she made. We did this intensively on, uh, at, for one year. 108 women, 72% delivered within a couple hours of arrival. And uh, as she said, about 4% were, were missed opportunities. Um, a couple of them had medical, medical contraindications. 
<laughs> we also had these other concurrent uh, uh, events. One of them was pretty significant, something called Ohio Hospital Compare, which essentially said, we're going to put your data in the newspaper or online. And that was true across a variety of healthcare outcomes, one of which was the 39-week project and another of which was rate of steroid administration. I'll show you some data about that in a minute. But that had a, a notable effect. The other thing was the, the leftover, as I noted in the first slide, of, of, of the dissemination of the 39-week project at the big hospitals. Everybody had some sort of re research staff, data staff, once we got outside the big teaching hospitals, we had to, to go with birth certificate. We really couldn't expect these smaller hospitals to hire staff people or to have staff in, in place. So what the CDC did and what Ohio Department of Health did with us was to create an effort, a very focused effort that I'm not very good at explaining, that, that identified key variables on the birth registry not every single thing, but third can be called it a baker's dozen of key variables, De redefined or, or explained the definitions, and then recruited the birth registrars in the state of Ohio. They, they already go to work every day. They, they're proud of what they do. You and I don't talk to them. I had never talked to any birth registrar in Ohio or in my hospital until this project and it was the first time they had actually walked into labor and delivery, seen a delivery, talked to a neonatologist or a labor and delivery nurse or an obstetrician. And when you told them their data was important and that we were looking at it, they were excited. I told them I would pay for the beverage bill if the state of Ohio would pay for the food and housing of the birth, first birth registrar annual convention in Columbus. And so far I've, I've got some money reserved for that, but the state has an anteed up. But they are, they are an excited workforce who have come to our learning sessions on more than one occasion, and they want to, to do stuff. They're really quite uh, an untapped resource who became engaged around 39 weeks and who have since become engaged around steroids, and we look forward to using them again. So we got this uh, series of things, ODH, Ohio Hospital Compare and then the CDC funding that helped a lot to help us improve the accuracy. Now here's the slide you've seen before. This is the, the uh, birth registry data graph down here, 2006 to 2014 now. And Ohio Hospital Compare starts here. This is 30% rates of steroid reporting. Here the state says we're going to put you in the paper, doubles the rate right there. Our hospital was among those. Our rate was zero or one percent or something back in here. Nobody paid attention, so no one wrote it down. Went up, and right around in here, in the aggregate, this is where the project, our project was right here, just for a little more than a year, right there. So we bumped it up again, and we've made a little more noise recently about the better birth certificate, and we think the dissemination project has moved this one up here also. So this is pretty good. Pretty good. Now, what about this? Here's our four unidentified Ohio hospitals. I might have known when I picked them out of the list who, who was who, but I certainly can't remember now. But they illustrate variations in steroid use as documented on the birth certificate. This is only birth registry data. Uh, that's all. Here's a hospital where Ohio Hospital uh, Compare made no change. Ohio Perennial Quality Collaborative big change. Here's Ohio Hospital Compare, nothing. They didn't read the papers. <laughs> OPQC, OPQC, they paid attention and the rate went up. Here's like some a little bit with, with Ohio Hospital Compare, a little more again. Here's the hospital, nothing. 60% all the way across. They paid no attention, you might think. Here's one where the change was all by themselves. Our interventions were here. To, you know, they decided to get better, and they got pretty, pretty good. We're going to look at the first couple of these in a little more detail. Here's this one hospital. I forget, let's go back and remind ourselves. This is the hospital where o OPQC, whoops, got to keep my button straight. This is the hospital where OPQC seemed to get all the, all the credit, and in fact, maybe deserves all the credit. 
not much, not much. A little bump here, this is um, on the birth certificate. But if you look here, they were above 90% pretty much all the way through here. So that kind of gives the lie to what was going on back here. They were probably doing better. And here's that hospital that didn't seem to change at all on the birth certificate. If you look more specifically at their time here in this little window, they were above, 90, well, above 80 certainly, but above 90% much of the time. So they basically didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the birth certificate before, during, or after. They just were doing it right, and they kept on doing it right in terms of their hospital, but they weren't really paying much attention to what other people were, were doing. And maybe after our um, presentations, maybe they'll pay more attention to the birth certificate. So statewide, it's pretty clear that hand-collected data, as you've heard, is better than birth registrar data. We found the same thing regarding the levels of the hospital that you reported from Utah, the level threes were better than the level twos, were better than the level ones. And interestingly, although only Jennifer and I know, where are you, Jen? Only Jennifer and I know which hospitals are in which region. They, they used to have numbers that have since been uh, lost, right? These regions no longer apply. But if you use the old region system, uh, region one was um, better than region four, which was better than region five, et cetera. We had regional variation in administration of steroids using this sort of data. Now you can argue whether region two and six were actually getting the sweet spot all the time and region one and four were giving it to everybody at 28 weeks. We don't have that kind of nuanced information. But we did see regional variation, which means there's more opportunity uh, despite Methodius's comments about how hard that is, there's more opportunity perhaps for us to get uh, a little better. So I think that my message is the same as what you've heard before with the additional emphasis on publishing the rates, publishing the rates in some format, in, in the newspaper, on a website, through a quality improvement matters a lot that although hand collected data is better than birth registrar data, the birth registrars are the key to the future. We cannot continue to have hand collected uh, uh, teams of, of uh, healthcare workers in smaller hospitals and expect that to be paid for in today's system. You have to ha use the people who are already there and they are ready and waiting. I'm sure there are exceptions, but we've been, we're just very gratified. The smaller hospitals are important, especially if you're in regionalized care systems. Certainly for us, 40% of the first doses were given in smaller hospitals. And again and again, the, the problem for us now is finding the right patient at the right time. When we missed them and when we gave steroids at the wrong time, identifying that patient is the key. So with that, we were gonna turn over now to Bill and then Ann is going to follow. So Bill will talk about Florida. Thanks, Jay. Good, good to be with you all. I had a great session today, and we're, we're learning a lot. I'm actually going to be talking about the, the big five and our planning to work on ACS as a QI initiative. Uh, this is very strategic. You all had this national meeting bringing everyone together to learn about it because the big five states are very interested in actually launching an initiative to work on antenatal steroids. So it's really a great uh, brain trust to help us think about what to do. Um, I do want to appeal to our Big Five group. We're using the acronym ACS. I actually really like the idea of ACT only because from a marketing perspective, ACT may be a better tool to market than ACS, so I think we should consider that. Um, Scott talked about it briefly this morning. The idea of the Big Five is that together the Big Five can accomplish something significant. It's about 40% of births and turning preterm births. We can not only make a difference in our states, but what we do in our states affects the nation, and we also have the ability to disseminate to other states. So we've been working together now for several years on this concept. Um, our first initiative, we worked at uh, implementing the California Toolkit, thanks to CMQCC, uh, the California Department of Health, and the March of Dimes. They put together this toolkit. We actually piloted this in 26 hospitals. Uh, last year, we published in OBGYN our findings where we implemented the initiative in the 26 hospitals in January 2011 at a 
rate of early elective deliveries of 28% among all early term births. And we're now down to a 5% at the end of the year. And that's without having any change in medical indications or in spontaneous. With many groups are having shifts, we were able to document there were no shifts. So we were very pleased with that. So what was our next initiative? And we decided to focus in on antenatal steroids. Why? One, we wanted something that would be a message that all of our hospitals should be working on. It clearly related to a joint commission measure, so it should be of interest to our hospitals, which becomes a driver. Two, our focus is on uh, reducing preterm birth or the effects of prematurity, and antenatal steroids fit nicely into that window. And three, we wanted, uh, to be honest, a no-brainer. There should not be any clinical debates about whether we should or should not be doing it, and all the states felt like we really had a need. So we did a survey to try and understand whether our hospitals felt there was a need. So we conducted the survey from November 13th to March 2014, just a few months ago. We used a common survey. New York did it through SurveyMonkey. The rest of us did it through a common Qualitrics survey, but they were the same questions. Uh, our response rates weren't exactly as much of what we wanted them to be. In Florida, we always run a little bit better than 50%. It doesn't matter what we do in our state. Incentive, non-incentive, it's going to always be a little bit more than 50. California was much lower at 32%. Illinois was much lower at 50%. Texas really was only able, because of manpower, to look in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and only has 17%, and it probably affects a lot of the results. So as you see Texas results, interpret that with a little bit of caution. And then New York consistently does well at about uh, three quarters. We think a lot of that is now that our labor and delivery hospitals are getting lots of surveys and we're hearing a lot of fatigue. So what are our findings? Well, we asked them, so how well do you really think you're doing? Well, as we've heard today, most people report they're doing pretty well. Whether they are or not is another question. It, this is a, um, Again, 60, 70 to 80 percent felt like they had uh, less than 5 percent. Uh, and very few here, a, a fair proportion, about a fifth, didn't really know. However, we do accept this and recognize this with a grain of salt. And for example, in Florida, this is our Vaughn data for all of our Vaughn hospitals. Uh, we have 30 level three hospitals, uh, 19 have agreed. Uh, to share their Vaughn data of the 28 who actually have Vaughn data. Uh, as you can see, our data goes from mid-50s up to about 90th percentile. Our median is at about 77. Uh, the 75th percentile is about 85. Talking with Jeff, and they actually in their Vaughn data are able to talk about those who shouldn't have gotten it, and he estimated maybe looking at his data about 10 percent more absolutely probably uh, didn't need to get any steroids. So if that's really true at 10% more, we still have only 25% of our hospitals that have a 95% rate or better. So we think our data is not as, as good. Uh, now it may be if we go to the charts, we'll get better reporting, but Florida is a very independent state. We're not big on deregionalization and telling people what to do. Um, we don't join organizations of our 116 delivery hospitals. Only 75 are part of the hospital association. Only 48 participate in the obstetrical HIN. And only 20 something actually want to report what they're doing. So we're not big into participation. If you look at our regionalization numbers, we keep increasing. We now have 30 level three hospitals among the 116. And we still only get 78% in a level three hospital. So we're not convinced that our numbers are anything like Ohio's or California's. I'm a Missouri person now. I guess you're going to have to show me in the numbers how good we really are. Uh, the other states have some of the same issues. Um, so what did we learn? When we asked about barriers, again, two-thirds to 80 percent said there really aren't any barriers. Impressive. Um, the next two highest barriers are differences in physician opinions on timing and administration of doses which thought was interesting, and that the staff don't really collect or track the data so they don't really know what's for sure going on. Um, we asked them where they were with the Joint Commission because most of them should be working on it during this time period. 
Um, we got variation with, oh, go back. Texas was higher. Um, Illinois and California were a little bit better, but New York and Florida weren't, well, New York and Illinois weren't as far as California. But again, we have a few in process, a few later, a few in the future, a few not planning at all. So really not a lot of progress on this measure, even at the turn of 2014, or they didn't know. Um, in terms of hospitals that actually implemented an initiative, in three of the states, New York, uh, Illinois, and Florida, almost half of them haven't really done anything related to antenatal steroids. Um, of those who did, many of them done internal initiatives, very few had other initiatives. So we saw this maybe as fr fruitful ground if they really have not focused in on these. Inter uh, interested in the resources. Uh, a lot over the map. They wanted data tools. They wanted online packages that they could ac to, access to. Some wanted a hospital QI toolkit. Um, not as much support and actually, actually doing things with data and grand rounds and such. So what was their likelihood of participation? Well, we were all over the map. So as an epidemiologist, I'm going to break this down into subgroups and make this a little easier for you to see. In Texas, who had the low response rate, um, a large proportion really didn't. But in talking with our Texas group, they think it's because that may be the group that's actually working on it already. So therefore, I'm sorry that I keep hitting this, that it's not an issue. Um, if you go to our next one, though, if you look at New York and California together, um, you've got a little bit across the board, not as much on the definitely and vary, but you've got some variation of interest. And when you go to Florida and you go to uh, Illinois, we have strong interest in actually having hospitals participate in initiatives. So we do think there's still room, even based off of hospital interest, in, in doing something. So what is the next step? Well, we're at this meeting. We're actually meeting tonight. We're going to meet tomorrow afternoon to really work hard on our planning to knock some of these things out, determining implementation strategies, determining what our algorithms should be, components, and designing our system. And we really appreciate the opportunity to be here and garner all of your thoughts uh, to give us something in terms of what we can do and act on this issue. With that, let me turn it over to the next, Ann Borders. Thanks, Bill, and thanks, Jay. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, I'm going to be sharing some information about um, what we've been doing in Illinois around uh, quality. And uh, when they, uh, when Jay and Bill and I have been talking about this, and uh, I said, well, we haven't run, done an antenatal steroid initiative yet in Illinois. But um, what we want to share is what we have done, uh, which is the structure that we've put in place. And then, um, as Bill said, you know, what is the interest level and what's the possibility, what, what potentially uh, might we do and what does some of our data look like? Um, and so with that, it's the green button, green button. Take the big green button with the, the arrow. <laughs> so I'm going to just go through a brief overview. I'm going to talk about um, some of our initiatives and then what data we do have. So, um, so I think what's interesting about this is the, we don't have up-to-date data, which is just a story of our life in, uh, for, for all of us and not for all of us, not in Ohio, um, but in, in, in Illinois. Um, so we've got about a 12.1% uh, rate of preterm birth in Illinois. Um, it's expensive, and we're very interested in figuring out how to reduce. Um, so we, um, as many folks, have been very interested in starting a perinatal quality collaborative. And this started for us um, back in 2012. So uh, not that long ago, um, the perinatal task force was given the um, the mission to give a report to say what do we need to do in the state of Illinois to address this issue and to reduce uh, prematurity. Um, and Pat Prentice, who is here today, um, played a big role in developing this task force. Um, and it's really this, the same issue of trying to get folks from across the state to work together and figure out how to solve problems. Um, and one of the key task force recommendations that was bolded at the end, and I think Pat helped maybe bold that. Um, was to provide resources for a perinatal quality collaborative to work in tandem with our regional perinatal system, um, which we have a strong regional perinatal system in Illinois, to engage in ongoing quality improvement initiatives. Um, so in Illinois, um, what we have put together, um, and many, much of what we have done has been from learning from a lot of the folks that you guys have heard from today. So we spent a lot of time, um, and in fact I spent a lot of time still, 
um, emailing Jay or emailing Bill or Elliot Bain in California to say, uh, what do you think? What should we do? Um, uh, and learning from other people's uh, uh, successes and challenges. And I think as you think about putting collaboratives together in states, uh, not only do you find ways to bring folks together in your state to be collaborative, what's really exciting and wonderful is what is going on here, is that collaboratives are collaborative, as it turns out, um, and work really well to try to learn. And I think that's some of the things as we think about antenatal steroids, looking to see, uh, you know, what did Ohio learn? I, I, I think it's that slide that Jen Baylett put it may be the most important slide of of the entire morning or the entire day today, you know, what did they learn already about antenatal steroids? Um, what did they find out from doing their collaborative? And as folks set out on doing this in additional states, um, it's really um, incredible to have, you know, the shoulders of these guys who've done the work uh, to stand on as we move forward. So what we've been able to do in Illinois um, pretty quickly since this uh, 2012 kind of endorsement occurred. Um, we held a series of stakeholder meetings. That's what everyone does when they're trying to launch something, uh, get people to, to buy in. Um, and uh, we got lots of people talking about how to set up a mis vis mission, vision, and goals. Um, we built partnerships with our neonatal colleagues. And again, these are all lessons learned that I think, you know, sitting down and talking to Jeff Gould and talking to Jay Imes and Bill, what do you want to do? You've got to build those collaboratives. You've got to get the obstetricians and the neonatologists in the room. And one of the things, even here today, it's been really interesting. People use different language and they think about things differently. They see the same data and they think about it differently when they're from an obstetric mindset and a neonatal mindset. Um, they look at problems and they see different answers. And so bringing these folks together um, has been really powerful. And I think the same thing happens on the big five, uh, having these folks in the same room so that we can look at the same problems from different perspectives. Uh, we had the uh, real, Fortune in Illinois, PQCI, uh, Aki Noguchi, is Aki here, maybe he's, there you are Aki, raise, can you raise your hand, there's, there's Aki. So he had been working uh, with, with neonatologists in the state uh, on neonatal uh, quality improvement initiatives. And, um, and so they had already been going, you know, neonatologists are really good at QI, they get together, they talk, they set on a project and they, they go forward. It's, it just doesn't seem to be as easy for us in OB, but we get there. Um, so uh, PQCI had been really moving, and so we partnered with them and brought and said, let's come to the table and form a collaborative together. Um, we got startup funding, which was really essential, as everyone knows, that um, getting some funding is what can really make uh, things move forward. Um, and, then, uh, and then we sat down to talk with folks, and we went on this big kind of um, uh, collaborative consult trip. Uh, a bunch of us went to Florida for the <coughs> Florida Parental Quality Collaborative. And then we, we um, it just so happens at these collaborative meetings, you know, all the key folks who are building collaboratives are there. So it's a really good place to go and uh, make everyone sit in a room with you and tell you all their secrets. So um, I think we got Jay and Bill and Jeff Gould and like everyone to spend an hour with us and say, if you were going to build a collaborative from scratch, what would you do? Um, and then we wrote everything down. Um, so, uh, and then you got to get everyone in your state. Um, so we got uh, all the key folks, all these folks who are doing all this different maternal child health work in a lot of different silos to get in the same room and talk about what their goals and how they can come together. Um, and, and it was great. And we were recently at a meeting where folks were supposed to give reports on what they're doing with evidence-based breastfeeding. And they had a big uh, agenda where a lot of people were supposed to give their reports. And then everyone stood up and said, well, we're working with ILPQC. We're working with ILPQC. We're working with ILPQC. And it was really great because it was all these folks from different perspectives coming together uh, to work together. And so that's been really effective. Um, so, uh, and, and that's really what we've been, we've set out to do in ILPQC is set up an independent statewide collaborative organization to build and work together with the regionalized perinatal system. Again, working with the Department of Public Health um, and, the, and what you have and the, the strengths you have in your state is what we were tr really trying to go with to get access to vital records and uh, hospital outcome data. Um, develop our own secure web-based data system. Um, potentially in the future, interfacing with EHR takes time and money, uh, so we're not that, there yet, but certainly that's something that a lot of folks are thinking about. Um, and then engaging with birthing hospitals, as these guys have all talked about. Um, and one of the key things that I think as we talk about doing initiatives like antenatal steroids, um, and I know this is a message that we got from Ohio and we got from 
Florida and California, it's really thinking about how to engage people that adds value, and not just adds value, you need to be low burden, high value. And that's the message, I kind of every time I get up to talk around the state, um, that it's really important that you keep those two things in mind, because when you're approaching uh, all these folks and you have this burning desire to work on antenatal steroids or evidence or early elective delivery or breast milk or whatever it is, you're sitting in a room with folks who have various levels of um, passion for that issue that you do. And so I think this um, concept of really keeping that low board and high value in mind has been really important. And, and I think as we think about antenatal steroids or what other initiatives, um, we, we really need to keep that in mind. Um, those are our stakeholders, our structure. I think it's very similar to what Ohio had talked about, a leadership team that meets weekly. We have our collaboratives from our key stakeholders who advise on a very regular basis. We have three work groups that have really been the, um, the meat and potatoes, I think, of our, our collaborative, uh, which has been really, um, uh, it's been really, I think, enthusiastically grasped. We've gotten folks from around the state to work on these work groups, um, and we have monthly meetings our monthly calls, and it's really great when you hear from a chair of an OBGYN department uh, who calls in and, and then the next speaker on the phone is someone who fills in a birth certificate, and they're equally talking about the same issue and giving their thoughts, um, and then they advise down to our initiatives. Um, and I'm gonna watch the time so we have enough time for questions. Um, so what we've done in the since we kicked off, we had our kickoff conference in November, and um, we like to say that the the folks from Ohio basically sent their like A team to come like kick us off. So they came, I think five of you, something like that. Five. I think five. Um, so we just brought, we're like, just come and help us get started. So uh, five of the leaders from Ohio came um, and spent the day with us and really kicked it off. And I think a lot of that enthusiasm from Ohio and the ability for folks in Illinois to say, you know, look what can be accomplished, um, and look what can be done, and look how enthusiastic, and look what they've been able to succeed. It really. Thank you. We offered them a chance to come to Toledo, but they didn't. They turned it down. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as nice as Chicago. Um, so we, uh, and we really, it was really inspiring because we, it was one of those things when you start to have a kickoff conference, and we said are people gonna come? You know, we just have no idea. And so we would sit around at these planning sessions and we got this big room and then um, it ended up that uh, we had a waiting list of folks who wanted to be at this conference and we had over 180 uh, nurses and obstetricians and neonatologists and public health folks and um, Illinois Hospital Association, March and Himes, they were all there. Um, and uh, we got, Jay gave the keynote and it was just a, um, I think it was a really great way to show that a, a collaborative can happen and then very quickly, I won't go through everything, but we did a series of uh, boot camps, which were basically to try to continue to engage with hospitals around the state and keep the enthusiasm going. So we did uh, every other month, we had a four hour learning session webinar on various QI topics and had national leaders come in and call in and do a 30 minute talk. Uh, we kept them updated with webinars. And then we, and most of that time was really to buy time while we were getting ourselves organized. So um, they were, uh, we were doing the boot camps and in the background we were setting up a data system. We were working on a data use agreement. We were doing all the things that needed to happen. Um, and then finally we started um, this month, or last month now, with our monthly team calls. So the neonatal initiative got up and going in January, uh, which is um, based on neonatal nutrition. And then uh, we started our early elective delivery initiative um, uh, this month with 43 hospitals. So uh, I'm gonna skip through this so we have time for questions and I wanna get to what we're thinking about antenatal steroids, but we have 44 hospitals participating in our OB initiative. Um, and when we say teams, we say at least one nurse and one physician, and now we're kind of moving to add a quality um, staff member as well because it's, we have found when I gave a talk at a quality um, meeting that they were feeling a little left out, that the nurses and physicians weren't always talking with the quality folks, and so we're adding that. Um, and then we have 19 hospitals that are collecting data on the neonatal initiative. Um, and we have a quarterly newsletter that's getting started and we have our website. Um, and we have, uh, these are our different networks in the state. So we have hospitals engaged from every network, so all around the state and then across all perinatal levels. Um, I'm gonna briefly just say that we have a neonatal nutrition initiative that's led by Dr. Um, Noguchi who's here. Um, and they're looking at uh, neonatal nutrition for preterm birth. Um, babies and trying to optimize growth to get in the top quartile of the Vermont Oxford data set. 
Uh, and they started, did paper collection in January, and then they moved into our, our web-based secure data system um, last month. And then our obstetric or elective delivery initiative, um, it was a little bit of uh, catch up in a way because so many hospitals have been working on this for so long. You don't want to go in there and have folks think that you're saying, um, oh, we've got this great idea, let's work on early elective de delivery, when everyone's already been working on it for a long time. What we're trying to do is give hospitals support to make sure that they are able to see how well they have been doing, or if they haven't gotten there yet, how we can support them. So we're, um, we're collecting PC01 data um, to give, again, that low burden, high value. Um, they already collect the PC01 data, we've already got it, and we're going to look at it quarterly for 2013 and 2014. This is what we do when we give the data back to them. Um, again, we just say what your hospital's data is, and then it compares how it looks across the state. So you can see, again, it's the same thing that Jen and um, Jay were talking about, getting data and then sharing it so that they can see how they compare. So our potential future initiatives, uh, evidence-based breastfeeding, um, optimization of birth certificates, and antenatal steroids. Um, so our antenatal steroids uh, for the neonatal centers, um, again, this is that variability. Um, these are 16 neonatal centers um, that participated uh, in um, the initial uh, neonatal initiatives in Illinois. Um, and you can see that there is some variability in antenatal steroid use uh, across those 19 centers. Um, and this looks at uh, inborn versus outborn uh, across quarters. Uh, so that's in Illinois. Um, and you can see that there's a big difference. So the inborn, uh, 82% and then 91% so, um, uh, versus outborn. Um, we know that, so we know that there is some variability um, in Illinois. We don't know how much that is due to data collection like Jay found in Ohio. Um, we know that there is some interest in participating, although it's interesting that it's, um, when you talk to obstetricians versus nurses versus neonatologists, you get various levels of, of interest and I think that's what we should you know, talk more about. Um, and this is this issue that some folks were kind of talking about, the challenge with antenatal <coughs> steroids is that it's not just about every baby who's born preterm. Uh, it was a miss if it didn't get antenatal steroids. It's that challenging decision-making process that goes on that OBs think a lot about. And neo neonatologists see this baby was born preterm and it didn't get steroids. So I think bringing those groups together to talk about this um, is really important. And we think about messaging. I think that's where this is going to become a really important topic tomorrow um, and ongoing when we, when we meet. Uh, we know that there's folks that are interested in participating. We do have some hospitals who have said they would willing to pilot it in uh, Illinois. Um, we also have some, um, I think we have some hurdles to get through in terms of folks who, um, you know, feel like we've, we're doing antenatal steroids. Is this, um, are we going to improve our data collection or are we going to make a difference for babies? Are we going to get more antenatal steroids on board or are we just going to show that we are doing it? And that's a big question that folks, I think, want to answer. That's a good question. So that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions from the floor? Everybody tired? Uh, thank you. I just want to ask how you deal with some of the smaller hospitals. We've kind of struggled with this in Delaware. And although the processes of delivering steroids are the same, the data comparison is difficult in that it, some of the smaller hospitals, we found they've had two numbers for delivering steroids, either zero or 100 percent, because they, you know, they may have one or two potential babies a month. And therefore, the data comparison becomes very hard. Yeah, we, we haven't uh, dealt with that issue re regarding steroids in Ohio. What we have done is uh, um, successfully now partnered with the Ohio Hospital Association, which creates another uh, very strong group that hospitals kind of traditionally belong to and, and traditionally are sort of uh, protective of their, their prerogatives as hospital administrations. Um, Having them join us in the last year in OPQC and be an active participant on calls is the, your, your question would immediately send us to the person from uh, Ohio Hospital Association who would be able to, to drive our 
initiatives there because they've dealt with that kind of thing in big and small hospitals usually. So I, I would think for us, it's Bob Falcone who's, who's a surgeon and has the, uh, the attitude of a surgeon. He goes straight to the problem and cuts it out if, if he can. Uh, and I would expect him, I don't know the answer to that question, but I would expect him to go straight to that, that issue and, uh, and address it as they must have for other similar phenomena where they, for very small hospitals. We, I just want to say that we had, um, I was on a panel t uh, maybe two weeks ago with the Illinois Hospital Association um, where uh, I, we, had, we brought in one hospital that was very large and then we had another hospital that um, does 42 births a year. Um, or something like, I think something like that. Uh, it's very small. And, but they were presenting their QI work uh, around evidence-based breastfeeding. And I think what, what they are, um, sorry, around early elective delivery. And I think what, um, what was really nice was that they were doing just as much QI work as uh, <coughs> you know, the big hospitals <laughs> presenting. And they um, break down and look every month at every birth that occurs and they, as an entire OB group. So I think it's, Although the data itself, when it gets compared, you know, 42% versus this, that's when you have to go back to the hospital and say, the hospital itself then has to kind of look at each case and they have to decide, you know, did they do what they wanted to do or did they not? Um, and they actually, we kind of pushed it as, oh, this is actually beneficial because they can review every case, whereas the bigger hospitals can't. Um, is that what you were getting at or more like? Yeah, I think, I think what you're advocating is look at an individual level at the data which are important. Again, so some hospitals will have 0%, but they only had one or two babies deliver, and they feel down about that. Boy, our numbers are zero, but in fact, you know, there may not have been an opportunity there. Or their numbers may be 100% because be they careful only had two. So identifying uh, <laughs> hospitals with very small volumes, we, right. we've tried right. to protect it's the, uh, you know, the autonomy of each hospital and uh, to, to have a hospital with a small volume often means that reporting data for that part of the state means you're reporting data for that hospital rather right, than right. that kind of stuff. So, so those, are, those, those are those are the issues. That that to be humorous at epidemiologists, you all are, are as non-epidemiologists talking about the data issue and I'm going to talk about the policy program issue. The problem with smaller hospitals too is not just the data, but at least in Florida they are fairly independent groups, and when I say small, our smallest hospitals deliver about 100 births a year. We don't have many who deliver fewer than 100. But between about 100 and 1,100, they don't have to report to the Joint Commission. They tend to be um, less staff and less resources, and there tends to be less motivation frequently on some of the quality issues. So from us in a volunteer state where everybody gets to decide whether you're in or out and what you want to do and what you don't, it's a hard group for us to actually get on board to some of the quality improvement pieces. And so I, I just, I wanna say there's more than just a data issue with some of the smaller hospitals. Sure. Ron. Uh, two questions, Jay. Uh, the first one with your slide that showed the percentage of patients that you hit in the quote sweet spot, does that include any patients that had a second course of steroids? So when you say they got this yes. sweet spot, did you miss on the first dose and then get the sweet spot on the second? The answer to that is yes, we, but I can't tell you what percentage of those patients were first time winners or second time winners, but it was the most recent course of steroids that was recorded. In that yeah, because what call, uh, called my attention to it was the number that were far or treated too soon was relatively low because studies that just give the first course, those are 50 to 80 percent. So it just demonstrates the, the need for the second. Yes. The, the second question is, is more general, and that is we've talked a lot about the 90 to 95 percent appropriately treated, but do we have any idea of what's happened to the total number of patients treated? And as you start putting things in the newspaper and you start calling attention to all this, are we starting to over-treat? And yeah. shouldn't we have some ratio, like the number of appropriately treated to the total number treated or something like that, so that we can begin to understand and also be able to calculate whether we're actually getting better at targeting the drugs, not only giving the drugs. Yes, that's a very good point that actually Ed Donovan brought up right in the very beginning about the large number of babies delivered at term who receive a steroid bolus uh, somewhere in the middle of neurodevelopment. And there is this animal data that makes you feel a little anxious about that. 
I don't think there's any human data. But anyway, those are very valid questions that I thought were going to be answered in toto tomorrow morning with all the science that was going to be <laughs> Yeah, I, if, if I may ask someone, and just uh, the presenter from Utah, uh, since you have so much data, do you know how many babies are actually treated to get your number of cases that were successfully treated in the window? Yeah, that would be believable. Thank Go you. Ahead. Hey, Jay. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting that, you know, previously uh, that, um, you know, you had shown that there's um, quite a bit of success with your model versus Intermountain Healthcare's model where it's, it's so labor, uh, you know, uh, intensive and so forth. And this scalability of, you know, if you have like 100 births, that's probably manageable even with a minimum crew because, you know, you're able to QI those pretty extensively because it's only like, you know, 15 a month or something like that. Um, so just uh, having a question as, as to without any really structured intervention, and it's, it appears that just being part of the collaborative and just the education had a great impact on, on this, and do you think that there's a, a, a limit that you can get to this, particularly when you're bringing in 39 weeks and you have ACS and now you're going to do all these other programs? Isn't there a cap that you, you know, th this, this scalability of this model? Where do, where do you see that? I'm not sure if I agree with your premise, though. I, um, the, the, um, one of the features of, of Ohio and the steroid project was the incredible in improvement simply from the Ohio uh, Department of Health announcing their intent. And even the announcement of the intent drove the numbers up and the actual start date drove them up even more. The, what OPQC does is, is to, to advance whatever the project is, is fairly um, comfortable for me on a once a month phone call, but behind that, there are these quality improvement coordinators who are busy every day talking to the hospitals about, have you done a PDSA cycle around that problem? And let's see, another hospital in the state has solved your problem. They did it this way. Would you like to talk to them privately, uh, not on a big phone call? So there's, there's a lot of buzz going on. Um, so the scalability is, is probably limited by the number of Susan and Beth's um, you don't need, you know, John and John to put the two, the birth certificate and the uh, hand collected data together is probably scalable uh, with just maybe one more person or something. But we need an awful lot more Susan and Beths to do the, the visits, site visits, phone calls, phone calls, phone calls, and feeding this uh, quality improvement stuff to each individual hospital around its individual problem. How do we handle doctor obnoxious who wants to schedule his patients when he wants to schedule his patients, and he is the chief of service. You know, he's setting the bad example. Or how do you deal with the? the I mean, it just you, the list goes on and on. And so um, scalability is an issue. Yeah. Yeah. I, I well, don't know how to get. Uh, maybe I didn't answer your question. Well, the the thing is, is that um, you know it, it appears that Ohio has a um, a baseline level of understanding of how to do quality improvement cycles that maybe other hospitals or other states don't have, you know. And, and so just to have them come together as a collaborative and, and say, well, this is a template, you just go and do this, you know. It, it doesn't necessarily, in, in my um, experience, work uh, well in, in many places and so forth. But, you know, your uh, data indicates that at, in a large group setting, you know, that's, that's not even connected at all, that you supply this information and all of a sudden they just take it back and there, there are some, you no, know. It's, it's, yeah, um, we're doing progesterone now. And yeah. that is a completely, so far, has been a completely different experience because the, the inpatient teams in neonatology in particular, we modeled ourselves after Ohio Bond, and we just tried to make an OB version of the Bond one-page data set and be as simple as possible and be as easy to fill out as possible. So hospital people on both sides of the delivery and NICU they do that stuff. They're used to that. The outpatient people we're dealing with now around progesterone, we're, we're piloting it in clinics that are attached to the hospitals. So same hospital, different folks, different teams, ask them to pick a physician leader, a nurse leader, an administrator, be on the call. I mean, my hospital, 
I don't know if we got time for that. You know, in one of the clinics where we would think they would want to be part of it, another clinic is, you know, I own that clinic, so we are part of it. <laughs> it's, it's mine. But if I, you know, don't make it home for some reason for a while, it, it could wither. There's no outpatient quality improvement, and, and we are having exactly the problem. You know, I think we'll be okay. We'll, we'll get there. We have, it's a different project. Um, but it is completely different in terms of starting it up. There is not this big embrace of, okay, we'll do that. And then just one final comment. Uh, you know, that, that list of projects that you guys are, you know, have in the future pipeline and so forth, it makes a lot of sense for like antenatal steroids, which is it's cross-dimensional, you know. It, it doesn't matter whether they come in for preterm labor or for bleeding, uh, placenta previa, abruption, hypertensive right. disease. It's just that they, they have to have that window. Uh, what do you think about an approach of basically this is Standard care is just embedded within these different processes. So it's kind of one global prenatal care process rather than, well, this is just another project. I think that's a good idea. Well, I heard, I'm not sure who I was talking to, a lot of different people so far, but about packaging uh, the, the care package for prenatal or for premature birth should include, uh, if we were to do it in Ohio, it would be uh, steroids, it would be, did she get progesterone? It would be, did she get educated about, uh, she was, she's going to provide milk for this premature baby because milk is medicine. Uh, did she get educated about the next time, smoking cessation, prolongation of the inner pregnancy interval, sure. LARC, that package, we create an order set. We, we put that out there as an idea to simmer in the future pot right now. That's all we've done. Hi. Oh, Jay, the, uh, what, the last uh, one, Russ says last question. Count, counting my question or not counting my question? <laughs> I have a 17-part question. You can't be answered. <laughs> a multi-part question? 17 parts. You ready? No, uh, I acknowledge that the rising tide floats all boats and that everyone in Ohio, Florida, and Illinois wants the health of women and babies to be better. My question is a practical one. In a state, I live in a state wh where there is competition. Uh, for referrals, for births, for care. Uh, and the notion of contributing data uh, in an anonymized fashion where there's sort of, you know, behind closed doors we can rise the t tide to float th the boats. is one, one kind of approach where people can be comfortable and paranoid thoughts don't enter. When things go into newspapers uh, and there's this system versus that system where smaller hospitals feel like the bigger hospitals are threatening them, how do you mitigate those concerns. And maybe you didn't have to in your state or the, the three states that we heard about, but I think I would in mine. Yeah, we, we haven't had to mitigate that yet in Ohio. OPQC has been able to be anonymous and show each site its own data compared to the aggregate of the other participants. The ODH, Ohio Department of Health, gets to be the bad guy. JCO, LeapFrog, they're the ones that, you know, are the, so to speak, the police. They are out there enforcing, publishing. We're at OPQC, we're here to help you and make sure that you look good on the next report by the evil empire of the newspaper, <laughs> whatever. We are not, the, we don't tell you what to do. That's been our approach and it's been um, reasonably um, successful. We've been very careful not to reveal, a, we have no leaks out of, out of OPQC for anything. If and a hospital wants to leak, they can leak, but we don't re release anything except the aggregate. Same in Florida. We are very, very pro-business, and so um, anything that we would do that would imply that we would provide hospital data, especially anything that we get from state data that we do for quality measures, um, I'm sure we'd have a legislative bill that would no longer allow that within minutes. Mm -hmm. So we really do work hard on just providing data back to the hospitals in a comparative fashion, but anonymously. I, I want to make one more, one more point because Russ is uh, telling me to sit stand down. This is, process, this is process data. You know, Ohio is one of the worst states <coughs> in the country in infant mortality and prematurity rates. We're terrible. That drives us a lot. So we talk about success in process measures in OPQC. They have not yet translated into real improvements in dead babies in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And that is whenever I feel like I'm losing an audience, I say dead babies. Because mm -hmm. that infant mortality is like a statistic, but the death of a baby is like, whoa, mm -hmm. let's talk about that. 
works. Thanks for that. Thank our speakers.